Good morning, everybody. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, if you would please. The Gospel according to John, chapter 16. Great to be with everybody this morning. I hope you're doing well. Good to see all of you. Jesus has been explaining to his disciples in very clear language that when he leaves, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will come. And he will fully indwell all who confess him as Lord. He's been explaining this in great detail. In verse 29, his disciples react to what he has taught them. It says, his disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. We believe it now, they're saying. We get it. We understand what you've been trying to teach us. So they confessed him right there, but in verse 31, Jesus answered them, do you now believe? It's a question. As if he's to say, oh really? Verse 32, he said, behold, an hour is coming and has already come, forecasting his coming arrest, which will happen very shortly. Judas Iscariot will soon betray him. He will be arrested. He will be taken to trial and nailed to the cross. He said, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So awesome. The disciples had made a bold declaration. Now we believe. Now we understand. We're with you now. They had been questioning, and why doesn't he talk, and you know, speak plainly. They're whispering behind his back, and he knows what they're talking about. He says, hey, are you talking about this and such and such a thing? And they said, now you are speaking plainly, not using a figure of speech. We believe that you came from God. And Jesus responds and says, really? He said, do you now believe? He said, an hour is coming, and you're going to be scattered. You will leave me, and you will leave me alone. You will abandon me, despite their bold promise that they were with him. Perhaps no disciple came stronger and bolder in his assertion that he would never leave Jesus as Peter did. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26. We'll be back to the left a little bit. Matthew chapter 26. All four Gospels record the stories that we're looking at this morning here about Peter and the disciples in this hour of trial at the crucifixion. The different writers of the four Gospels at times focus and highlight different things for different reasons. So they don't all tell the story in the exact same way. It is the same story, but is from a different perspective. Matthew records very clearly what Peter said to Jesus. This is the same moment. And Jesus is saying that they will be scattered. Verse 31 of Matthew 26, Jesus said to them, you will all, talking to the disciples, you will all fall away because of me this night. You're all going to leave me tonight. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the, of the flock shall be scattered. It's a prophetic word from the Old Testament prophets. Jesus at the crucifixion and, and the disciples leaving him would be a fulfillment of that prophecy. And Jesus said in verse 32, but after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Verse 33, Peter responds. Peter says, even though all may fall away because of you, he said, I will never fall away. So he argues with Jesus. He said, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter responds again, verse 35. 
Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples, inspired by Peter's boldness, all the disciples said the same thing too. So they're like, oh man. So they're arguing with Jesus. He said, there's a prophecy and you're all going to leave me. They're like, no, we're not. No, we're not. Peter's like, I, I, won't, I will never leave. If they, and he blames the other guys. If they all fall away, I won't, even if I have to die with you. And so the disciples hear what Peter just said. And they're like, oh, yeah? Well, we won't either. And they're all there. And Jesus says, look, it's, it's going to happen. Not only is it going to happen, it's going to happen tonight. Luke chapter 22. Over to the right a little bit. Luke chapter 22. I like Luke's record of this event because he shows us one thing. He mentions one thing here that happens that the other Gospels do not. I'll show you. So here's what happened. After Peter had said, I'll never leave. Man, how many people say that, you know? I'll never be unfaithful to the Lord. Never again, we say, right? I'll never slip into sin again. I'm never going to abandon the Lord. I'm never going to get away from God. I got away from God, and it didn't go well. I got away from the Lord, and it was a miserable experience, and I regret what happened in that season, and I've come back to the Lord. And what do we say? We stand with Peter. I will never leave you again. If I have to die with you, I'll never leave again. I'll never grow lazy and complacent in my walk with the Lord again. We all say it. Verse 54 of Luke 22, having arrested him, Jesus, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance the same day. Why is he following at a distance? Just a couple hours ago, he was ready to die with Jesus. I'll never leave you, but he sees something now. He sees the cost of following Christ. He sees what Jesus has been talking about the whole time, and it has finally come to pass. He sees that things are going south. He has been he brought into the house of the high priest. They are grilling Jesus in there. He knows they mean him harm. He knows that they have no interest in his disciples. They're going to want to know who's with this guy. So all of a sudden, Peter puts a distance between him and Jesus. Like, oh, you know what? I think I'm just going to hang back and see how this shakes out. The same guy that on the same day said, I will never leave you. And he said, I, if I have to die with you, I will never fall away. Is now following in the shadows in the background trying to blend in. How many times in our life have we put distance between us and our Lord? Because of we fear what people might think about us if they identify us too closely with Jesus. We fear the pressure that might come from our family we, we fear what people might say. They might kick us out of our social circles. We may not be accepted or promoted at our job in the same way if we stand with Jesus like we always have and that we promise to do. So what do we do? Put a little distance. Put a little distance between Jesus just in case someone's around that doesn't like what Jesus stands for and might recognize us as having been with Jesus. We don't necessarily want everyone to know that we walk with Jesus. So we put distance. And then things start to fill in that distance. Fill in that space, sin and temptation and selfishness and fear. And so Peter's drifting. Somebody today, you might be drifting. Barely made it here. Not sure if you're coming back ever again. You're like, I wasn't coming today. This person, I got this pressure. I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I did it for them. But, I, but you feel, but you know the Lord. I'm talking about people that know the Lord put distance between them and Jesus. But you got here, but you feel that distance. I remember seasons of my life, and, and it was like you were barely hanging on, you know, and, and Jesus was getting further and further away, not because he was leaving you, but because you were leaving him. You, you were walking toward the world. Your affections were turning to other idols of this life and the desires of the flesh, and, and, and you, you're like, man, I, I can't do both. So you try to balance the middle for a little while, doesn't work, and then you drift Further and further away. That's what Peter was doing. Verse 55, after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. Look at that. 
the part of the people that were in the crowd that came to arrest Jesus. These are not the disciples. These are not followers. These are people that are critics. Some are probably just neutral observers wondering what's going on. Some people hate Jesus. And so they're all gathered around this fire that night out in the courtyard of the house of the high priest. And it says Peter was sitting among them trying to blend in. People try to blend in. Try to blend in with your friends. Try to blend in at your school. Try to blend in at your job. Just want to blend in. Nothing to see here. No convictions to see here. There's no light. Don't look. There's no light. Don't worry about me and I don't worry about you. Just leave me alone because we don't want that social persecution that comes when they know that you walk with the Lord. So what do we do? We just sit among them. We laugh when we're supposed to. We talk like they talk. We do what they do. We agree with things by our silence. We just sit among them. And a servant girl, verse 56, seeing him as he sat, Peter sat in the firelight, should have sat toward the back. <laughs> a flicker of that flame lit his face up, and that girl did a double take. <laughs> That's what happened. A girl seeing him sat in the as he sat in the firelight, looking intently at him. Look at that. She <laughs> said, this man was with him too. She blows his cover. He's out there in the night, like, and he's looking... The same day, the, keep in mind, don't lose this. The same day he said, I will die before I abandon you. The same day. How quickly, how quickly we throw overboard our bold promises when a little pressure comes, when a little attack from the enemy comes. That girl, all she had to do to get Peter to deny is go, he was with him. I saw that guy. No, no. Hey. I saw that guy with him. Verse 57, but he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. That's one. That's one. Verse 58, a little later, another saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. That's two. About an hour had passed, another, look, it only takes about an hour or so for all three to happen. About an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean too. Another gospel says, they heard Peter talking, and they said, no, I recognize that accent. You're from a different region. You're not from around here. In fact, your accent sounds like his accent. You're a Galilean too. Verse 60, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. That's three. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Only Luke records this part. Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Look at that. He's in the house. Didn't you say you're a king of the Jews? You have a kingdom, all the, whatever they're saying in there. Don't you claim to be God? This man has committed blasphemy. The false witness, hasn't he committed blasphemy? He's in the house. Peter's outside. He sees what's happening. But somewhere from inside the house, whether he looked through a door or a window or whatever the situation was, Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And while under trial, Jesus goes, told you. And the rooster crows. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. How many times has Jesus given us that look in our heart? When we denied him, when we could have spoke up, not for the things of the world, but for the gospel. When people had questions and we didn't want to answer them because it might identify us as too close to Jesus. But you knew the answer. When people had criticisms about God, when people wondered things about death, when people wondered why things are the way they are in the world, and you, and you had the word of God written in your heart and you knew what the answer was and you could have answered and you could have given them the, the information they were looking for and they might have liked it, they might have hated it, they might have hated you for it. Who knows what would have happened, but you knew. And what do we do? Nothing. What do we say? Nothing. 
That in and of itself is oftentimes a denial. I remember I, I, I told the kids camp a couple weeks ago, the young kids that went up to the camp about a missed opportunity was the theme of that day. And I remember I was on a bus on a basketball team in high school. And there was a coach and some of the players were talking on a long, dark bus ride after some game that we had played somewhere far away. And we were coming back in the night and the, the coach was critical of God and he had questions about God, like a lot of people do. And he wondered if there is a God, then why these things? And some of the players joined in and started to offer their own ideas. And I think maybe this, and it wasn't right. It wasn't what the Bible says. And I think this, and that's why I don't believe in God, you know, and these things were being said. And I could feel something boiling inside of me because not not anger, not rage, not offense on behalf of God. The answers were boiling inside. They were asking questions. I knew what the answers were. I knew all I had to do was go, well, I don't know if you believe it or not, but the word of God actually addresses what you're, you're asking about and what you're talking about. Would you like me to tell you what it says? I knew what it was. I could have quoted it pretty close to him. I didn't have a Bible with me, but I could have showed them later. I said, yeah, hey, listen, I, I could probably find that if you want. I could show you the, the Word of God addresses exactly what you're talking about and people with the questions that you have. And it's okay that you have these questions. Would you like me to help? You know what I said that night? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Distance. Distance had grown between me and Jesus. And in that distance was fear of rejection of my friends, the judgment of my coach, the possible ridicule that might come. How many times have we promised with Peter that we'd never be a coward again, that we'd be a witness if God would only open the door and we'd say the words if he would give us the words, that we would never stop serving because last time when we drifted apart from the Lord and the fellowship of the body, the church, the world took over. And we fell into a pit and caused ourselves great harm and pain in our life. And that we promised the Lord when we repented that time and came back, we were never going to do it again. And we said, I will never prioritize my job over the things of the Lord. I will never prioritize my sports team or my hobbies or a sinful relationship over the conviction of the word of, my, uh, the word of God in my heart ever again. I will never do it. I will never leave you. I will never drift. How many people hear a rooster crowing this morning? There it is. How many people feel that look from Jesus going, I told you. Though we leave him with the disciples many times, though we put distance and though we abandon, you know what the Bible says about Jesus? When Jesus was looking at Peter that night, there's, Jesus was not looking in judgment. He was not leaving Peter. Peter went out and wept bitterly, tears of broken repentance because it was true what Jesus said. He would be scattered, and it wouldn't take much. But the Bible says that though we abandon him, though we are faithless, he is faithful. The Bible says for those of us that know the Lord and have called unto him for salvation, that God will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, that Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what the Bible says, forever. His love toward us, his redemptive power, his word, his promises, though we break ours all the time, though we walk away with Peter, though we sit by fires and try to blend and hide in our sin for the acceptance of man and people and social circles, he never leaves us and he never forsakes us, not ever. John chapter 16 Verse 33, where we started. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you. Look what he says. So that in me, you may have peace. You're not going to have peace in the world. You're not going to have peace in society. You're not going to have peace with every friend you've ever had. You may not have peace in your family. He said, but in me, you will have peace. No matter the circumstances, no matter the attacks, no matter the storms. In fact, look what he said. In the world, you have tribulation or trouble. 
That's the truth. It's true then, and it's definitely true now. In the world, you have tribulation. He knew that that would happen. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Yes, he has. He has overcome the world. He has overcome the power of sin. For those that call upon him as Lord, he has washed us and made us a new creation. He has broken the bondage of sin over our lives. He has overcome the devil. The Bible says in 1 John, the Son of God came for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. He said, I'm giving you a peace. John 14, 27 said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And then he says, not as the world gives do I give to you. The world gives a false peace, an artificial peace, conditional. And it doesn't last and it doesn't deliver. It doesn't satisfy our soul. It doesn't keep the promises the world makes. And Jesus said, I don't give peace like that. He said, my peace I give to you. And he said, in me you will have that peace. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, it says, let the peace of Christ, listen, Somebody's struggling with many things today. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule, it's like a king. What is your ruler? What rules your heart this morning? What is the master of your emotions? What dominates your thoughts? The Bible says when we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, that the peace of Christ can rule in our hearts. That no matter what rages around us, we can stare it in the face and have what the Bible says is a peace that surpasses all understanding. People will attack you, people will slander you, circumstances will befall you, your health will fail, your money will fail, your job will go away, your family and every friend will leave you, and somehow we have a comforting peace, a mysterious peace that rests heavily upon our soul, where we can look the storm in the face and we are okay. A peace that surpasses all understanding. When it rules our heart. A lot of people that are Christians, that are true believers, me included, go through seasons though where we, like Peter, we have a distance that grows and something else begins to rule our heart. Some of you today, you may know the Lord, but something else has taken over the throne of your heart where Jesus and his peace belongs. Some people that are Christians, fear is ruling your heart. Christ cannot be, the peace of Christ cannot be ruling your heart and you'll be filled with fear at the same time. Something is the king of your life. Those do not both occupy the same space. People are afraid of things for themselves things for others. They're afraid for tomorrow, even though Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Who of you, by being worried about tomorrow, can add one hour to your life? And we worry about everything. People come along and they're like, you believe what's happening out there? Yes, I believe it. You know why? Because Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. There it is. Guess he was right. I'm going to let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. Somebody's like, yeah, everyone's shocked. Thank you. Thank you. Help me preach. Thank you. I was like, somebody is surprised. He said, why are we surprised? Christians walk around like they're shocked that people are bad. Sinners acting like sinners. You know what sinners that don't know the Lord do? Commit sin. And Christians look back. You believe these people? Yep. Yep. What else would they do? What else would they do? That's why we have the peace of Christ. Right. What else would they be doing? That's why we offer the light to the darkness. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we're supposed to walk up next to them and have a peace that surpasses all understanding. So they go, how do you have peace and I don't? And you tell them and they are, become believers. Amen. Now come on. People are shocked. They watch the news. I can't believe what's going on. I can't believe you haven't read the Bible recently because it tells you what's going on. <laughs> About to get mad. About to get mad up here. People, people let the, speaking of mad, people let anger rule their heart, Amen. right? Somebody said something about you, oh man, and, and, and you know, now we're seeking revenge. That's not the peace of Christ. That's what rules you. That's your true Lord. That's your master now. Anger over what somebody did, what somebody didn't do, the hurt that somebody inflicted upon you, 
right? Words, something that happened long ago in your past, you just hang on to it. I'm glad Jesus didn't hang on to when Peter denied him and put that distance and swore three times he never knew him. I'm glad his grace and his mercy forgave Peter and restored him, and he became a powerful servant of the Lord later. I'm glad Jesus didn't hang on to the times that I have denied him, that I have gone silent when I could have spoken the truth of the gospel, when I could have resisted sin and I chose to dive headlong into the dark pool of sin myself and deny him. I'm glad that he forgives me and doesn't hang on to that, but we're gonna hang on to something for somebody else. And we let vengeance and we let hatred and we let bitterness rule the throne of our heart where the peace of Christ should be. What rules you today? We could just, if it's something else and the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart right now, we could just repent before the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for loving me even when I've walked. Thank you for loving me even in the distance. Thank you for loving me in my weak times. Thank you for loving me in my sinful times. Thank you for loving me in my denials. God, I repent, I turn, I give over my heart to you where your peace should have been and deserves to be. I have put the idols of these other things, feelings and you know, uh, grudges and all of these things in your place. God, I repent. I'm tearing it all down by faith and humility. Take over, Lord, where you belong. I'm sorry. Let the peace of Christ, the love of Christ control me and compel me from this point forward. The Bible says that he has overcome the world. Though you have trouble and though there is tribulation, he's overcome. Romans chapter 8, take a look. Over to the right in your Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Though Peter grew distant and though we at times grow distant, and when I say we, I'm talking about those that have truly come to know him, I wonder if you've truly come to know him. When have you called unto the Lord to be saved for real? And when we come to know him, the Bible says in Romans 8, 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody. What can separate? Nothing. And he goes down a long list of things that cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress, the trouble of this world, the trouble in our families, the trouble in our lives, trouble in our bodies, does that separate us from the love of Christ? No, of course not. He talks about persecution. He says, well, persecution... And as a result of persecution, those that are truly and heavily persecuted, famine and nakedness, they took their food, they took their clothes, peril or sword, they beat them, imprisoned them, and killed them. Even then, does that have the power to separate someone from the love of Christ? Of course it does not. In fact, the disciples of old in the book of Acts, Peter and John, when they were arrested, when they were beaten, when they were put in prison and brought to trial and then later released, the Bible says they basically went skipping through town rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rather than put distance, they were happy to be identified that closely to Jesus that someone felt necessary to beat them for his name. Amen. And we want to run from it. We want to run. We're like, oh man, I don't know. You know, we go silent over the smallest things sometimes. And he says, look at, listen. He says, he says, will anything, will persecution of any kind separate you from the love of Christ? And that's all you need to know is that nothing. And that's what they're trying to do by persecuting you is separate you from the love of Christ. They're trying to separate you from your conviction, people in your life, circumstances that surround you. They're trying to mute your witness. He says, can anything really have the power to do that? No, it cannot. Verse 37, he said, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer Conquer sin. Conquer the spiritual powers of darkness that stand against you. Conquer the grip of the enemy. Conquer those that seek to render you silent for the Lord. He said, we overwhelmingly conquer through him, not through our own willpower. Our own willpower looks like Peter denying him at the fire. 
Not through our knowledge, not through the wisdom of man, not through our own strength, but through him who loved us. That's how we conquer. And he's not talking about conquering for the end result of obtaining the things of the world. You understand? He is speaking from an eternal view here. He is speaking of a conquering that happens deep in our soul. Deep in our heart. He's not talking about conquering so you can do better at a game. You know, a sports game or something, or conquering so you can get a raise at work, or conquering so you can get the better society that we wish we had. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about conquering, meaning that we have, a, we have an eternal uh, inheritance that stands secure no matter what the outside world brings against us. We have a promise that one day, he will descend from heaven with a shout in the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. And the Bible said our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We conquer our circumstances in the moment because we hold on to our citizenship from another place. We hold on to an eternal promise that nobody can take away. Amen. So we conquer from deep. We, we conquer. And so when, we, when he conquers deep in our soul, we have a joy unspeakable in the face of the worst storm of your life. We can look and we can look with joy. We have peace on our face. Our peace itself is a witness. People don't understand it. That's why it says it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. People look at you and they're like, how are you doing that? I don't understand how you're doing that. And we have a chance. We have a chance to be a witness for the Lord. We overwhelmingly conquer. He says, look what he says. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death, he starts with the big swan. He said, well, what's your problem? Is it death? Death can't separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He said, and neither death. He said, so what does the Bible say? He takes away, when we come to know the Lord, he takes away the sting of death. He takes away the power of death. The Bible says, what's it say? Uh, uh, the, 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 the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? right. David said, even though, I love it, Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, I will fear no evil. I love that. Sometimes we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You feel that shadow pass over your life. Somebody facing an illness right now, that shadow of death. Somebody that's experienced a loss of some kind, that shadow passes over you. Every now and then we get a glimpse of that shadow like on a sunny day when the cloud blocks the sun, and casts a shadow, and you're like, oh. Two days ago, I did a funeral for a wonderful lady, sister in the Lord, older saint. Used to come and sit in a wheelchair and just worship the Lord and bring so much joy to me as a pastor. She loved the little kids walking by. And we had a funeral planned a couple days ago, and it was supposed to be in this room. And uh, then the power went out. So I'm like, oh, man. So I, I call the family, and I'm like, hey, the power's out, and you know, the bathrooms are kind of a thing, and the lights are okay. We have a generator, but it doesn't do everything. You know, is this, is this how you wanted to celebrate the moment? I'm fine if you are. They were like, no. Why don't we do it in, in her backyard instead? We got a backyard by a lake. Why don't we just, you know, call an audible, and we'll do it different. It sounds great. I went out to a backyard, and man... A couple years ago, she came down at a service out at Silver Lake and got baptized. People helped her in the water. My friend, Pastor John, baptized her. and Someone took a picture of her coming out of the water, a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ applied to her life. And so we had her funeral in the backyard. And we had speakers set up, and we were singing songs. People were laughing. People were sharing stories. And I was preaching the hope of the gospel. And honestly, this sounds like the craziest thing to say. It was kind of fun. It was kind of fun, wasn't it? Some of our family here today. It was kind of fun. And that sounds strange. And it doesn't make any sense. But the Bible says what? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. We have grief, but it is not without hope, and it looks different, and you can tell the difference, and there was the hope of the Lord that was present, and so what happens? The Bible says the Lord takes away the sting of death. I didn't feel the sting of death. I saw the shadow of death. It passes over us. It made me think about my own funeral coming. Told Lindsay what songs I want. 
I have. I'm like, look, I'm going to be dead one day. I'm probably going to beat you to the grave. If you're around, here's the song I want. I want, I'd rather have Jesus at the end, you know, and I want people to, I want that to kind of land, you know, it's like, like we're playing the whole thing. Told my wife, don't screw it up. I want a bunch of somber music and people bawling, you know? I want it to be a celebration, not of me, but of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who through him we overwhelmingly conquer, through him who loved us, because I am convinced also that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, nor things present, or things to come, powers, height, depth, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Convinced of it. Jesus said, my Pete, in the world, you will have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Yes, he has, and yes, he will. Oh, man. For some, it might be hard to believe today because you say, man, my father didn't love me like that. Everyone who said they were going to love me unconditionally never did. My father didn't do it. My mother didn't do it. My husband, my wife, my parents, my children, my friends, my family, everybody that ever said they would didn't. So it's hard for me to believe this one. That's why he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you do I give. He said, I, they may have left you, but I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. They may have changed, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that's the only comfort you have, it is the only one worth hanging on to. Amen. Oh, man, would you bow for prayer this morning? Man, somebody today, God, just maybe stirring your heart, encouraging your soul. I hope so realigning some priorities in your life maybe. Somebody today, you say, man, some distance has grown. I'm reminded this morning that some distance has grown between me and the Lord. Hey, I don't judge you. I've had numerous seasons like that. And just like Peter, I promised it'd never happen again. And it sure did. You hear that rooster? I'm so thankful for his grace his patience, his long-suffering toward us. Somebody today with a heavy burden, some kind of tribulation, some kind of trouble, I want to encourage you, whatever it is, I don't know how it's going to work out, I really don't. But I'll tell you what, whatever it is, it cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. I'm going to do something we do once in a while. I just felt it deep in my heart as, we, as I was preparing the scripture and the message for the weekend. I'm going to open these steps up here just as an altar of prayer this morning. Nothing magical about it, but sometimes there's something about symbolically coming and just laying something down before the Lord. Some heavy burden, some struggle, some trial, something God is convicting your heart about right now. That he has spoken to you right here this morning. Say, Lord, here it is. Here's my burden. Here's my great hour of need. Here's my season of rebellion. I lay it down before you. I thank you for your mercy and I ask you for your help. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Give me courage in this storm. Joy in this trial. Overwhelmingly conquer in me, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. I pray that you lift somebody's spirits by the power of your word, your living word. Somebody that's put some distance, perhaps, Lord. I pray you convict them. That right now, you draw them back. That they would see all things clearly. Some of us that maybe have fallen for some temptations and tricks of the enemy. Reveal to us the truth, Lord. And draw our hearts back to you. Somebody that's afraid. Somebody that's worried. Somebody that's angry. God, I pray that you would bring a peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace so powerful, so profound, so real that we can't even understand how it's possible. But yet there it is, like a miracle. 
deep in our soul, carrying us through. And while the outer man decays, we are being renewed on the inner man day by day. Pray that for somebody here this morning, Lord. Somebody to be refreshed. Somebody to be encouraged and restored in Jesus' name. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Listen, I'm going to invite you to stand. Nobody's going to bother you. Our team's going to play. They're going to sing a little bit. If you want to come, you come right now. You want to bring somebody with you, you bring them. Just come. You want to come and pray and lay something down before the Lord, you come.